Hello, my name's Philip Graham, and thank you so much for inviting me to your to talk at your annual general meeting. I feel really honoured. I'm sorry I can't talk to you live on Zoom, but I think this is the next best thing. Well, why am I talking to you? I was a member of the Committee on Special Education that Mary Warnock chaired from 1974 to 1978. It was, I think, and many other people agree with me, uh, as you will hear, the most important report on special education in Britain ever. It set the pattern of special education uh, from that point in time up to now, and there's no sign of its influence diminishing as time goes on. Why was it set up? Well, there was considerable unhappiness in the late 1960s and early 1970s about the pattern of provision for children who had special educational needs. For one thing, there were then what were called ESNM schools, that is schools for the educationally subnormal. Now that's an awful term, and you may have seen some of you a, a recently shown film by Steve McQueen called Subnormal, a British scandal, in which he talked particularly about the way in which children of West Indian heritage were placed in these schools quite inappropriately. But it wasn't just children of West Indian heritage, a number of children uh, from all ethnic groups were placed in these schools uh, really, they were sort of dustbins uh, for children for whom mainstream education didn't seem right or they were they didn't fit in. Then there was the way children were placed in these schools. It was very arbitrary. Uh, if teachers didn't like children or found them difficult, uh, then they tended to say such children ought to be in special schools. There was the quality of the teachers who worked in them. Uh, some teachers, there were some very dedicated teachers, but some teachers thought uh, that this was an easy option with smaller classes and so they opted to go into them, even though they weren't very competent. And then there was a lot of pressure from parent groups. There was a man called Stanley Siegel who wrote a book called No Child is Ineducable, uh, and he put a lot of pressure on the Department uh, for Education and Science and uh, the various ministers responsible. In the end, it was Margaret Thatcher, believe it or not, Margaret Thatcher, who was Secretary of State uh, for, uh, for the Department of Education and Science, who asked Mary Warnock to chair this committee. Who was Mary Warnock? She came from a very privileged background, uh, went to independent schools, was the top scholar at Lady Margaret Hall College in Oxford, read greats, was a don for 16 years, that is a fellow of an Oxford college. And then she, having written a number of books, uh, she decided she was really bored with teaching undergraduates and postgraduates and became headmistress of the Oxford High School for Girls. She was a very good headmistress of this school and was definitely one of the great and the good. So when she retired from that position in 1972, she was available uh, to take part to a greater degree in forming public policy. I've written a biography of her, which you can look up, uh, you can download for free, uh, or you can buy the print, one of the print copies. How did it come that I was a member of this committee? Well, I was an academic psychiatrist. I was professor of child psychiatry at the Institute of Child Health. That's the medical school for Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. So I was a doctor, a psychiatrist, but also uh, I had quite a lot of experience uh, with education. I'd been involved in a study, quite a well-known study on the Isle of Wight, uh, where there was a special school then called Watergate, it's now called St George's, uh, and I'd interviewed uh, dozens of teachers, both in special and mainstream schools, and, and several hundred children I'd interviewed both those in uh, special schools and in mainstream education to find out more about them uh, and about other things, what they thought about the education they were receiving. A word about the membership of the committee. There were 26 of us, which Mary Warnock quite rightly thought was far too many. Uh, 
it's far too many for a committee of any sort, certainly for a committee uh, dealing with this sort of topic. There are one or two notable things about the membership. There wasn't a single person who had a disability or a chronic illness on the committee. Uh, secondly, there wasn't a single person from an ethnic minority. So uh, those two groups uh, that are disproportionately represented in special schools were not represented on the committee. All the same, I hope we did a reasonably good job. How did the committee work? Well, we took evidence, we had evidence, we asked for evidence and we took evidence from uh, a very large number of bodies. We made visits to special schools and to mainstream schools. I went on a visit to the United States with Mary Warnock, as it happens, and we looked at special schools and special facilities. And then, of course, the committee did have a large amount of experience among its members. There were teachers, professors of education, directors of education, and so on, and people from a bit outside like me. What were the main recommendations of the committee? Well, there were a number of recommendations, most of which seem completely ordinary, banal and unoriginal now, but at the time they were made, they were all pretty original. The first was that children shouldn't just be sent to special schools, without a great deal of, or receive special education in mainstream schools, without a great deal of thought. There was going to be, there had to be from then on, multi-professional assessment, which finished up with a statement giving the needs of the child, guaranteed provision. Statements have now been replaced by education, health and care plans, but the principle is still there. Multi-professional assessment, and then protected recommendations for the children's education. The second area which was new was the emphasis given to identifying children as early as possible, long before they went to what was then the normal age to go to school at five years. So from birth, children who were going to need special education were to be identified and helped. The third thing was that there was going to be a reduction in so-called ESNM schools, and these were going to have a change of name. They were going to be called schools for children with learning difficulties. Then the training of teachers was to be changed radically. Child teachers who were going to teach in mainstream schools were going to see a lot of children with special needs, and teachers in mainstream schools needed training in the the teaching of children uh, who had special needs. Then there was the issue of parents. Parents had been seen up to that point as the enemy, they had to keep them out of schools. The Warnock report said that parents in future were to be treated as partners with teachers, not as hostile elements in the situation. And finally, research. There was very little research going on at the time uh, and the Warnock committee recommended, as has indeed been the case, there should be much more research into special education. How was the report received? Well, uh, initially, uh, and for some years afterwards, it met with extraordinary approval. All the main political parties thought it was a wonderful report. And in 1981, uh, the Education Act was passed, which virtually uh, translated into legislation all the recommendations that our report has made. Its long-term impact has also been very considerable. 40 years after the report was published, an international journal called Frontiers in Education wrote in an editorial, the Warnock report was responsible for changing the conceptualization and legislative framework in England. The Education Act 1981 that followed the report had a totally new system for assessment and determining provision. Also, the Warnock report recommended elements that in many countries we now take for granted, but at that time were highly original. For example, the meaningful engagement of parents, including their being central partners in the assessment of special educational needs and in making decisions on the appropriate needs of individual children and young people a greatly updated process of assessment, the inclusion of a chapter on, of, on children under five years, the role of special schools, the curriculum, the transition from school to adult life, teacher education, the roles of professionals, the health 
and social services and voluntary organizations, and last but not least, research. So that was the verdict 40 years after the report had been published. I want to finish with an account of the controversy that took place in the early 2000s around inclusion and integration. And it's a controversy that still exists, as those of you who belong to Alfie will certainly know. Although I wasn't directly involved in that controversy, Mary Warnock repeatedly, and in fact somewhat inaccurately, uh, quoted me when she talked about it. There were criticisms of the statementing process, parents whose children hadn't been statemented wanted them to be, and vice versa. It was felt that there was a failure to integrate children who could be integrated uh, into mainstream schools and were inappropriately transferred to special schools or received special education of other sorts. Then there were other people who were very unhappy because they thought that Warnock had recommended that all special schools should be abolished and everybody, all children, should be integrated. That was not what the report said. The report said very clearly, we're in, and I quote, we're in no doubt whatever that special schools will continue to feature prominently in the range of provision for children with special educational needs. So whether that was right or wrong, that was actually what the report said. Mary Warnock quoted me in support of her defense of special schools. Uh, now I did, she was quite right. I wanted them, uh, I wanted special provision to be preserved. She, she quoted me and said that I wanted this particularly for autistic children, but it wasn't particularly children with autism I was concerned about. It was all children whose needs were not going to be met in mainstream education. Uh, no matter how much care was taken to make it available in mainstream and whose education in mainstream was going to seriously disrupt the education of other children. So I agreed with her, rightly or wrongly. Some of you, I suspect, will feel wrongly. That's all right. We're allowed to have differences of opinion. I just want to say a few more words about what happened to Mary Warnock after that report. After that report, she went on to share another, if anything, rather more famous report on human fertilization and embryology. It was about how help should be provided for childless couples uh, and uh, about embryo research. I won't go into the details of the recommendations she made in that report. She became mistress of Girton College, Cambridge, and was a member of the House of, made a member of the House of Lords, a life peer, and she was outspoken on all sorts of issues some of which were very unpopular, like euthanasia. She died in April 2019, two and a half years ago. And if you want to know more about her, then do download my biography for free or buy a print copy. And thank you so much for listening.